What's good everyone, Peter here, AKA StudyMate. I'm back with the next video in my Numerai Starter Pack series, where I try to give you everything that you need to make your own model for the Numerai tournament that you can eventually stake on. Now, in our last video, we covered cross validation and metrics. And now that we understand how we would evaluate our model, in today's video, we're gonna talk about modeling and how we can train our model in the cloud. We're gonna start off with a quick introduction to Dask. You know, we've mentioned it in our last videos um, and I'm not gonna go crazy into it today, but I just wanna cover enough of it so that we understand what's going on in the code and why we're using Dask. Then we're going to host the Numeri Supermassive dataset that we installed via the Numer CLI in a AWS S3 bucket so that it is able to uh, work with Dask properly. And then lastly, we're gonna go through the code, uh, spin up a Dask cluster uh, with coiled, and then we're going to actually train our model in the cloud. So with that being said, thank you for tuning in. Please like and subscribe if this content is helpful for you. And let's jump into it. So the first thing we're going to be looking at are the two types of problems that we might run into when trying to scale our machine learning project up from our local machine. Now, the first is a CPU bound problem. What that is, is there's just such a large volume of work to be done that it kind of overwhelms our single machine. Now, for example, if we're trying to do a hyperparameter search and there are, you know, five or 10 different combinations of models that we are trying to train and then validate, that's just a lot of work to be done. And that can take a really long time if we're just relying on, you know, one local machine. The second is a memory bound problem. And what that is, is we just don't have enough RAM or memory to even load or use the data set that we are working with. And it's important that we understand the difference between these two problems because there are different solutions for each one within Dask. We just need to know when to apply them. So let's now take a look at when and why we're going to be using Dask. We take a look at this screenshot here. This is straight out of my own code. And as you can see, I'm running into a memory error because I am memory bound by the size of the data set and the amount of RAM that I had on my computer. But what I like about Dask is they actually give us a little Q&A on when and if we should be moving over to Dask or our uh, machine learning project. So as you can see in this first one, the first question is, does our data fit in memory? And from the screenshot above, definitely not. So Dask might be for us. Number two, do our computations take forever? Which for me, again, that's a yes, because I used to run my, uh, keep my desktop on running all of my model fitting for a really long time. So yes, Dask might be able to help us in that area. And then lastly, and an important concept for Dask is whether or not our code code is parallelizable. Oof, that was a tough one. Um, and the reason for that is that as Dask scales more workers, our code has to be able to run simultaneously. Uh, and the reason for that is that, you know, if it can't, then having more workers isn't going to help if we can't really run the code in parallel. In our case, it is, we are able to run it in parallel. So again, three out of three Dask might be able to help us for our two problems. Now, if we look at the visual to kind of go with what we just covered, uh, everywhere but the bottom left is where Dask is applicable and where we are, since we are both compute bound and memory bound, we're in this top right quadrant, which for me, I see this as super applicable. Now, if we go into some of the actual Dask uh, theory, I'll call it. If we look at the collections, what you'll see is Dask actually does a great job of keeping their API very similar to two libraries that we're already very familiar with being pandas and scikit-learn. So if we take a look at these first two collections, we'll see the Dask array and the Dask data frame are pretty similar to pandas data frames and pandas and numpy arrays. But the two that we need to kind of learn to understand how Dask is suited for big data is the Dask delayed and Dask futures. So the two of these, what they do is that Dask actually does not immediately implement every single line of code as we write it. What it does is it collects all of the logic that we're trying to implement throughout our code. And it creates what we see here is this task graph. And the reason for that is that Dask doesn't want to immediately pipe in our millions of rows of data at every single step and at every single computation, because that's just going to be really slow and it's going to hinder our development process, right? If you had to wait at every single step here, this would be a lot, uh, 
would take a lot longer than if you elegantly laid out every single step, you told Dask what you wanted it to do at every step and it laid out the task. And then at the very end, you told Dask, okay, it's ready to go. Go ahead and put all of the data through it and give me my result at the very end. It's just much more efficient that way. So that's how Dask goes ahead and uses this Dask delayed and futures. Now, if we take a look at in practice, what that looks like, what well, we need a provider for our cloud services. And for today's video, I chose to go with Coiled. Now, Coiled offers hosted and scalable Dask clusters. So, you know, we can from our personal computer just spin up a Dask cluster of any size to work with the data that we're working with. And just quickly, before we get too deep into things, this is not a sponsored video uh, or an ad. I didn't uh, get paid by Coil to do this, um, although my DMs are open. And, and the reason why I went with Coil is just because they were the first uh, provider that I was able to run my code snippet with. I did try some other alternatives and I'll cover them in just a second, but again, not getting paid to do a sponsor or anything. In the bottom here, what I actually did is I actually stole this picture from Google Cloud Platform because I really liked how it visualized what we're going to be doing in today's video. So if we take a look at this personal computer, the cool thing about this is that this can be a laptop, this can be a, a medium sized desktop, uh, it can be really whatever. Uh, and I like that because we're able to, no matter how big our personal computer is, we can just scale this DAS cluster here as big as we need to work with our data set. And as you can see, each little Dask worker node here is essentially like another computer working on our project. Now, because of this, though, these workers do not have access to files on our personal computer. And that's why we need to host the Numeri data in this kind of third party location being this S3 bucket, because this is how they're going to be getting the Numeri data and kind of working in parallel with us. So now that we have some of the theory out of the way, let me just quickly mention some of the alternatives. Again, I ended up going with Dask and Coiled on this, but there were a bunch of alternatives in this space and there's a lot going on in this big data kind of ecosystem. I looked at stuff like Ray and Modin. They seemed very cool as a way to easily scale up your Pandas code. Saturn Cloud, I've heard good things about. Actually, I heard about a collab solution this week about how you can increase the RAM limits on the pro tier of collab. If you don't like what I use in this video, do check check those out as alternatives. I, I also did check them out. I just didn't have time to kind of make it into this video. I just went with whatever I could get my code up with first. So now that we've got all of that out of the way, let's jump into how to host our Numeri data set that we installed via the Numer CLI into S3. All right, so I've gone ahead and jumped over to my AWS console. And the first place that we're going to be going to is to S3. So just type it up here. We can go to S3 because we're going to be doing two things here. The first is creating the new bucket that we're going to be using, but also creating a pair of credentials so that we can programmatically access this bucket from our Jupyter Notebook. So to create a new bucket, we can go ahead and click Create Bucket. And it's pretty straightforward from here. We just need the name that we're going to call it. I'm just going to use uh, NMR-Starter Pack, if I could spell it correctly. And that's about it. We can leave all of the default configurations down here and just click Create Bucket. And awesome. Now that we've created our new bucket, we're going to click into it, click Upload. And this is where we're going to upload the data that we downloaded via the Numer CLI in our last video right here, the int eight. The only tweak that I've made from that last video is that I actually switched up back over to the dot CSV rather than the parquet. It's just a little bit cleaner with Dask for what we were trying to do in this video. So please note that there is that small change. But now that we've got that, we can go ahead and just drag and drop that over. And now it's queued to upload and I can just click upload. So it's going to go ahead and do that. It's about five gigs. So it'll take, depending on your internet, 10 to 20 ish minutes. But in the meantime, what we can do is just under your username here in the top, right? You can go under security credentials. I'm going to open this up in a new tab because what we need to do is now create a new pair of access keys. So I've got the pair that I use, but we're going to go ahead and create a new access key. I'm going to download it and open it up with notepad. Now, 
you want to be very careful with this access key because what this does is pretty much gives you full access to your AWS account. So do keep this secret. I know I'm showing you mine right now, but I'm going to delete this right after I record this video. So for you, uh, definitely make sure not to share this with anyone. Now, what we're going to want to do with this is we're going to have to load this in as an environment variable into our notebook. So we need to have it as a .env uh, file in our same directory as our notebook. So to do that, let's open up our file again. So here, just in the same directory as our Jupyter Notebook, I use uh, VS Code, Microsoft VS Code. So that's what I'm going to use to just create this .m file. For me, right click here and just go to new file. It's very important that you name this exactly .env. As you can see by the updated icon, it was recognized because I called it exactly .env. But if you don't, then it won't be able to be read in properly. And now here, I'm going to abbreviate the name a little bit. I'm just going to call the first variable access underscore key and then equal to the exact value that we just downloaded from AWS. And the second one is going to be secret key or secret underscore key. And this is again, equal to just copy paste what we just downloaded. Now, again, no spaces here. It's very important that it's exactly the way I just wrote it out. I ran it because if you put spaces, you'll run into an error and it won't load properly. And I, I ran into that error. Um, but if you have this exactly the way I just did it, now you will have access to your S3 bucket um, with a little bit of extra code, but we'll go over that in just a second. That's all that we need here. So I'm going to close all of this up and I'll do a quick cut because we're just still waiting for our training data to upload. But once that's uh, all uploaded and ready to go, we can jump back into our code and go into the coding demo of the video. Thanks and see you in a sec. Great. So now that everything is uploaded correctly, we can jump into the coding portion. So I have half of it filled in and half I'm going to code with you right now, just like in our last video. But the first thing we're going to want to do is run this first cell that is importing the coiled library. That's going to let us spin up our Dask cluster with coiled and also a few things from Dask. So go ahead and run that. And now let's go and use this coiled library to create our cloud uh, Dask cluster. So I'm going to create a new variable and just call it cluster. Let me just zoom in really quickly. Just make sure everything is, is looking good. I like 133. Make sure everything's nice and big. Cool. And this is going to call from the coiled library, just their own cluster method. And here we can specify a few things about our Dask uh, cluster and how it's going to run. So the first one is a parameter called cluster uh, software, sorry. And this is going to be equal to uh, my, so it's my GitHub, Peterling 7710. And I've called this software Pling underscore numeri. And what this software is, and I'll pull it up on my coiled dashboard, some old runs that I have had. But if I go to the software tab and hover here, what it is, is just specifying all of the pip installs that need to happen on every single one of those little Dask workers so that they have the same libraries as we do here on our local machine. It's very important that they match because if we have a different version of Dask, but we're telling our Dask workers to install a different version and there's mismatches and differences in syntax and the code, that's just going to create a big mess and give us errors that I ran into when prepping for this. So if you go ahead and specify a specific software, then you should be okay. Because if everyone's on the same page, then there's not going to be any configuration issues. So that's the first parameter. And then the second one is a backend underscore options parameter, which we're going to pass a dictionary and we just need to provide the key spot and just equals to true. Just keeps the cost a little low. We're using spot instances rather than dedicated ones. Uh, just kept some of the costs low. So that's it for the cluster variable. And then what we're going to now do after that is call cluster dot adapt. And what this adapt method does is it allows coiled to determine based on the amount of computation that you call in your notebook, whether or not to scale up or down your cluster. So I, I really like this one because, you know, when you're doing a bunch of stuff, 
what you do is you specify the floor and the ceiling and depending on what you're doing it'll it'll go up or down and if you're doing a bunch of stuff it'll go all the way up for you but if you're not doing anything it decommissions some of the unused resources so i've gone ahead and just provided a value of two for our minimum so our floor and then five is our maximum and that worked great for me again tinker with some of these as needed but i can go ahead and run this now and as you can see from this ui um, it's going to run it takes about three to five minutes to again depends on how big your cluster is but for this rather small one because this is going to take three to five minutes to spin up so again quick cut but we'll be back in just a sec Okay, so now that this is created and everything is up in my coil dashboard, so as you can see, we are running. We've got three out of the three, and I've got a little bit of cost uh, per hour as well as the total cost uh, accrued so far. What we can do is actually take a look at our client. So we have our cluster running, but now we need to run uh, or create a new variable called client, which is going to pull from this client that we imported from Dask.distributed. So the client just takes the cluster that we just spun up and then we can go ahead and just print the client once we've defined it and what you'll see is what this does is actually creates a link that we can click to so the dask dashboard if i go ahead and click that just opened a new tab to this dashboard that gives a little bit of a summary of the amount of workers we have active and what tasks they're currently working on so uh we'll come back to that in just a second once we actually start doing stuff because uh, we can see the vision visuals and how they're updating and the workload along all of our workers. But like I said, we need to first check now that the software on our local machine completely matches those on our Dask workers. So let's go ahead and do that with the client.get versions method. And I just need to specify this check parameter and just set this equals to true. The reason for that is that by setting check equals to true, what it does is it tells the get versions to raise an error if there is a mismatch in any of the versions but I set it up so that there isn't luckily. So right now we're not getting an error. So if you get this output, then you'll know that everything is okay. And that the versions, as you can see on the scheduler and the workers and on our client are all in line. So as long as there's no error there, we're good to go. So we can keep scrolling and we'll get to the environment variable part now. So here's where we're going to be loading in our AWS credentials that we set up earlier. And here I'm relying on the .env library to do that. So we import the load.env um, function from the .env library, and we can go ahead and just call that by doing load underscore .env and open and close brackets to run the function. And what this is going to do is essentially take the .env file that we have in our uh, folder and just load those into our um, environment variables. So now we can specify a key. We have to remember what we named them, uh, which was access underscore key. And maybe I can even pull it up just for reference. But the first one was access key. And then the second one, I believe, was just a secret underscore key. All right. So yeah, I pulled it up. So we did name it access underscore key and secret underscore key. So that's what we're going to have as our key here for the first one. And then we'll make a access underscore key variable, which is going to hold the environment variable value. So we're using the OS library to do this and they have a method get env and what get env is going to do is get the value at this associated key. We just pass in the key. So we're just saying OS, we're telling OS to just go to this env file and retrieve the value at whichever variable has this key and then store that into our new variable called access underscore key. And we can repeat this with the secret key environment variable. And we're just going to do the exact same thing for that os.getEnv and just pass in the updated key value, which is secret key now. So now we'll have two variables that will be holding our access key, our AWS access key and our AWS secret key. Awesome. And just to actually triple check, we can print that out just to be sure. Awesome. Now, the reason why we need this is because we're going to be also using the S3FS library, and that's going to be the glue in between our access keys and that uh, hosted S3 bucket. So as I mentioned earlier, when we were creating it, this is a little bit of extra code to kind of marry the two together, uh, but it's very easy. 
So what we're going to do is import their library here. And once we've got that, I'm going to create a new variable uh, FS, and this is going to call on this S3FS uh, module. We're just going to instantiate the S3 file system class, and we just need to pass in for the key our newly made access key variable, and for the secret parameter, our secret underscore key. And what this is going to do is it's just going to automatically, with these credentials, now load all of our S3 buckets. So from this, we can actually call the ls um, method, and all we need to do is provide a string to the bucket location. So the start needs to be S3 colon slash slash, and then the name of the bucket that we created here. So as you can see, this destination here, so this string, that's all we need to provide to S3FS. So NMR dash starter pack and boom, we get the contents of our newly created bucket, which because we uploaded the training data is now uh, just this numeri training data into eight CSV file. So awesome. We're in our code now, just to pause and kind of just, uh, you know, temperature check right now. We have now set up this hosted data. We've spun up a DAS cluster. And now in our notebook, we've kind of gelled everything together. So we have our data, we have our compute in the cloud all set up. And so now let's get everything together, define our model and kind of pull on all of the stuff we covered in our last videos to, to really put it all together. And to do that, we're going to be first creating a data frame. So I've imported from Dask uh, the data frame library. And what we could do is use their read CSV method to read in this uh, CSV out of this S3 bucket now. So I'm going to call dd.read underscore CSV. And what we're going to provide is just this exact string here. So I can copy paste this down here, but I do need to just append this extra little bit. So it's not just the bucket, it's the actual CSV file in the bucket. And that's it for this first one. The second thing is I also have to provide a second parameter called storage underscore options. And this is where we're just going to pass in these same credentials again, but as a dictionary. So I can copy paste this down here and we just need to format a little bit to make it match up to the dictionary kind of syntax. So key is a string rather than a parameter here. So I've passed in the location of the data I want to read in with read CSV and just my AWS credentials again, and then we can run this. Oh, whoops. Uh, it's a dictionary. So I need colons, not equal signs, but just like that, no error. So we're good to go. And actually just to jump over, we haven't done anything just yet with our DAS cluster. So just to remember, uh, just because we've added some logic in our task graph. Nothing is actually kicked off yet. So just to kind of go back and, you know, the Dask is lazy in that sense is we haven't, even though we've run some Dask code, nothing has actually happened yet. No, no work has been done yet. But if I actually call df.head here, as you can see, uh, it, it's not going to pop out right away like it does with pandas. Uh, it takes a little bit there. But if I jump over to my cluster, now we see that some work has been done. So it wasn't until I explicitly told Dask to do something did uh, or to, you know, provide me an output. Did it go and do the work? But awesome. Here we go. We have, so we have our data. Our cluster was able to talk to our S3 bucket and pull the data and load it into a Dask data frame. So what I have here now continuing on is just some of the code from our last video. So we're going to go in and create these uh, helper variables, create a new column again with called error no for the just a little bit of uh, syntax. And then we're going to, if we remember back to the last video, uh, create our filter because we don't need all two million rows of data. If we remember back, there's quite a bit of overlap in our data. So we can just take every fourth error and sample the data like that. So I've gone ahead and created this NumPy array, which it's literally just one, five, nine, 13, and so on from our last video. And now we're going to go ahead 
and filter down that initial data frame to only pull eras that are within this range. So to do that, and I'm just going to call this TDF, just a little small name change. And we're going to use the dot loc method. And in here, we can just pass into this dot loc method the filter that we want to apply to our data frame. And here, what we're going to say is look at the error no column that we made and check if it's in this filter that we've applied. And just like that, we now have our sampled uh, data frame. And just to be super clear on that, if I look at the shape of our original data frame, so if I print df dot shape, and I'll actually I'll actually do one more just to show this off properly. If I do df dot shape, so if we remember pandas, we would get the integer for the rows and then an integer for the columns. But as you can see here, it's actually a delayed Dask collection here because Dask will not compute this value until explicitly told to. It's saying there's some number of rows, but I'm not really sure yet. If you want me to go get that value and really go through that computation, I can, but I'm not going to just by default. So let's go ahead and just check the row count of our original data frame and then our filter down one just to be super clear on this. And then if so, if I kick off this computation, so dot compute will take our task graph and actually execute it and return us a real value to work with. And if I actually jump over to my Dask dashboard, as you can see, it's listing all of the tasks that it's executing and uh, gives us this visual of what our workers are implementing or what they're working on. Um, and it's very pretty, honestly, to look at. Sometimes I'd like to just have it on in the background and just and just watch it do its thing. It's very satisfying, uh, especially once it's doing like a whole bunch of if you spin up a bunch, uh, it, it definitely gets very visually appealing. All right. So I'm going to do a quick cut here because this will take like a couple maybe a minute or two. And I don't want the length of this video to go too crazy. Let's jump back to our notebook. What we'll see is the original data frame had about two and a half million rows and we were able to sample that down to just over 300. So now that we know everything is working correctly, we can move down to this next cell where I'm separating out the feature data in this X variable from the target data in this Y variable. So I can go ahead and run this. And the next thing we're gonna need to do is transfer these Dask data frames into Dask arrays. So in order to do that, I'll have to define two new variables. So I'll just call it XR and YR. And I'm first going to need to call the Dask.persist method. And what persist is going to let us do is just push uh, data that is going to be used frequently down to our Dask workers and so that they have access to it for all of the computations uh, going forward. So the first value here is just going to be x.2 underscore Dask underscore array. And this is the only parameter here is lengths. I'm missing a G. Yeah, lengths. And that's just equal to true. And we're going to do the exact same thing with y to dask array links is equal to true. And that's it. We can go ahead and run this. It'll kick off a new computation on our dask cluster. And we can kind of let this do its thing in the background for now. This next cell is exactly from the last video. It's just our time series cross validation generator and our Spearman correlation helper function. So all we need to do here is run this. So we have access to this stuff in this notebook. And then we can move on to the actual model uh, that we're going to be using for this video. And that is a gradient boosted decision tree. So the reason for that is they're just a very well-rounded and really good starting point of an algorithm. Uh, and we can see that in this very well put together meme, uh, even in the Kaggle community, it's a little bit of a joke that you can kind of throw these gradient boosted decision trees at a variety of different problems or competitions, and they'll just out of the box kind of do pretty well. Now, 
Because of this, there are several different implementations, each with their own kind of pros and cons. Uh, you've maybe heard of XG Boost or Cat Boost or the specific implementation we're going to be using in this series, which is Light GBM. Light GBM is known for being pretty memory efficient, which is good in our case because uh, we, we know from earlier that we were memory bound and that was a problem that we were running into when trying to work with this new supermassive data set. So next thing I just need to mention before going into the final code snippet is how we're going to also be using Joblib. Now Joblib, uh, this library that we're importing here is going to sit in between Dask and Scikit-Learn or LightGBM. And it's just kind of going to help us be the glue to our Dask cluster and some of our uh, traditionally single threaded libraries. So we can jump right into this final code cell where we're going to finally train our first model on the Numerai tournament data. So let's go ahead and do this. We're going to use the uh, with keyword to create a job lib context. So job lib dot parallel underscore backend and our parallel backend is going to be Dask. So the first thing I need to define are the fold scores. So this is just an empty list for now, but this is where we're going to be putting the individual K fold scores. And then we can create an instance of our time series split class. And I'm going to just do five splits for now. So number of splits is equal to five. And now that we have this, we can actually go ahead and, and do a quick kind of dry run. So let's see what this actually returns just as a little test. So we're going to use a for loop to iterate through each of the K folds. And at every stop in this for loop, we're going to get a new set of train and test sets. And this train and test are just two lists of indices telling us which rows are our test and which rows are our train, uh, train set. So inside of here, it's going to be cvgen dot split. So this split method from up above, and we need to provide three things to our split method, which is the features. The feature data so this is just going to be x array the target data which is our y array and the groups which again from our last video our groups for the numerai tournament are just the eras now now that we have that we have all of our training and test sets figured out for each k fold we can now create for each fold we're going to want to create a fresh instance of our uh, light gbm model so i'm going to call this lgbm underscore model and from here i'm going to be referencing our lgb library that i just imported up here and the light GBM developers actually created a custom class for working with Dask. The name for this is the Dask LGBM. And in our case, we're doing regression. So we're going to be using the Dask LGBM regressor to make sure I'm spelling my stuff right. And we're just going to create it with all of the default values for now. We're going to get more into the hyperparameter tuning side of things in the next video. So defining it like this is totally fine for now. And now that we have it defined, we can run the dot uh, fit method. Now, remembering that Dask and uh, Light GBM use a lot of the same uh, scikit-learn style APIs. So we have access to dot fit. And in just a second, we'll see some other ones. But for dot for fit, we're going to just need the feature data, which in our case is going to be referring back to our variable. And then we're going to index on the training set. So the training indices. And then we're going to do the exact same thing, but with the target data. So yr of train. I'll give it some breathing room. Now, once we've fit our model, we can go ahead and create some predictions. So our predictions are going to be equal to our fit model now. And 
just like before, using the kind of SK Learn style API, we could use dot predict where we are going to feed in our test set now. So our feature, our test set from our features, our feature data, and then we can uh, test these predictions or score these predictions using our Spearman function defined above. And now we're going to take the test set from our labels and compare that to the predictions that we just generated. Cool. And lastly, we're going to append this score that we just calculated to our fold scores list. Now I'm going to jump out of this for loop because I want to add a couple more print statements. I'm just going to print all of the fold scores just to wrap up as well as uh, the average fold score value. So I'm just going to use uh, numpy.mean here and that's it. We can go ahead and queue this up now, run this cell. And what it's going to happen is we're going to get five different splits at every split. We're going to get new train and test values. And this is again, two lists of indices and it's going to fit the model, a fresh light GBM uh, model. It's going to fit it, make some uh, prediction values, score those values, and then append it to our list. And then at the end, it's going to print out our list and the average correlation for our model. And that's it. We can kind of let this do its thing in the back end. This will take a little bit of time, maybe 10 to 15 minutes because uh, we're, it's doing quite a bit of work now and we're feeding, you know, all 300,000 rows every time to the algorithm. So I'm going to do one last cut and then we'll wrap up and check out the output here. So see you in just one last second. Okay. And there we go. So now that this is wrapped up, we can go back to our notebook and take a look at the output. Just some warning messages here, which is totally okay. But if we look at the bottom, here is where we have the individual fold scores as well as the average of these scores. And in a vacuum, you know, this correlation score doesn't tell us a whole lot, which is totally okay. Uh, we're just, you know, interested in getting one fold score because now in our next video, we'll look at how to tune this number and uh, go explore all of that. But this is actually where we're going to leave it for today. Again, to kind of recap in today's video, we looked at how to use coiled to implement and to spin up a DAS cluster in the cloud so that we could train our LGBM, our light GBM model uh, on the Numeri trading data. So in our next video, now that we have our basic model set up and all of this kind of infrastructure, we're going to look at how we can tune the hyper parameters to this model so that uh, we can really optimize for performance and, and uh, finally get a rough shape of what we could look at, uh, what would be like a stakeable model in the Numeri tournament. Again, if this content uh, is valuable for you, please make sure to like and subscribe. I'll be updating again the GitHub for the uh, notebook on this series. And then if you do want more Numeri content from me, or maybe just to chat a little bit more about Numeri related uh, things, I uh, please join the Rocket Chat for the you know, official Numeri community. But I also uh, put some work on my personal Discord where we chat about you know Numeri definitely, but also some other um, AI related topics, crypto related topics. So uh, make sure to join that as well, and we can chat in there. But for today, thank you for tuning in, and I'm out.